Thank you very much. Um, it's good to be with you. Um, 1966 seems a long time ago, doesn't it? Uh, at least to some of us. Um, I'm now one of the old retired guys. Um, but um, when I was ordained in 1966, some of you may remember what the times were like in those days, uh, the kind of social upheaval that was going on in our country. Uh, I should have had a clue, I think, uh, after my very first sermon at Grace and Holy Trinity Cathedral when, uh, when a rather large man walked up to me. He wore big horn-rimmed glasses, and uh, he reminded me somewhat of the cartoon character Senator Foghorn Leghorn, if you remember. He was a very large chicken. But he had a voice, much like that man, and uh, he put both hands on my shoulders and said, Boy, let me give you some advice about your preaching. When you preach, first of all, wave your hands around a lot. I like that. <laughs> and he said, secondly, when you preach, don't mention colored people. They're really happy people, and we've heard enough about them around here. That should have been my first clue uh, that uh, I was walking into uh, a world that was being turned upside down. Uh, some of you may remember that uh, the race issue was serious business in 1966. The civil rights movement had been largely confined to the South, but had now moved North. There had been urban riots uh, in Los Angeles, uh, in the Watts neighborhood in 1965. And between 1965 and 1968, there were 300 riots in American cities. Amazing. With 75 riots, the summer of 1967 proved to be the worst. Um, I find it almost unbelievable uh, that all that ferment was happening uh, at the time, um, as I look back on it now. But there it was. And I had just come out of seminary. I had been formed very much by the kinds of crises that were happening in our country, primarily the race issue. and finding a way to take my theological education and apply it to the real world. And here I was at 24 years old, ready to apply it. And, um, and that guy put his hands on my shoulder and decided that he was going to apply some of his own influence. But everything for me came into focus uh, during Holy Week in 1968. Uh, on April 4th, 1968, the Thursday before Palm Sunday, Martin Luther King was murdered in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, he was there, as you might remember, uh, supporting a strike by garbage workers in that city. And as he was standing on the balcony of the Lorraine Hotel, he was shot dead. I have since, many years later, uh, been to the Lorraine Motel and seen that place. It's now been turned into an incredible civil rights museum. And you may remember what happened. The country erupted in grief and violence. Uh, there was obvious tension in Kansas City as people worried that the violence happening in other cities might happen there. Uh, one thing that I would say, uh, as you know, Kansas City, Missouri, and Kansas City, Kansas are just stuck right up against one another with a river kind of running in between. And a couple of 
things happened on Friday after King's assassination, one of the things that I found interesting was the way in which uh, Kansas City, Kansas dealt with the crisis. The morning of school on Friday after King's death, a number of students marched out of school saying they wanted to march downtown. And the superintendent of schools showed up at the school and said, that's great, and I'll march with you. And he called the chief of police in Kansas City, Kansas, and said, I want the senior black officer to come and join us and march with us downtown. The students, the superintendent, and the black officer marched downtown. A couple of speeches were given. The superintendent said, there will now be a memorial service back at the school. The group turned around and walked back to the school and had a memorial service and essentially the crisis was over. In Kansas City, Missouri, uh, Clarence Kelly, who was the head of the, the police, by Friday evening had called a full alert and things were ready to roll. Palm Sunday, it was decided by the city officials and the church officials would be a day in which we would honor Dr. King. We would have a march in the city after church. And after church on April 7th, which was a beautiful sunny day, I, I, driving up here today from the lake, I thought this is how it looked that day, except that it was a lot warmer but it was clear and beautiful, just like today. Um, the clergy and a, a number of cathedral parishioners, Grace and Holy Trinity parishioners, joined with as many as 15,000 other Kansas Cityans in a peaceful march to grieve the death of Dr. King and to pray for reconciliation. On more than one occasion, people in the streets and speakers from the platform congratulated themselves on the nonviolent nature of our march. It was as if spring itself was blessing us and our peaceful march by decorating our way with blooming trees and budding flowers and that gorgeous blue skies. Other cities were experiencing riots in the streets, but we proudly said, Kansas City is different things would change. On Monday, newscasters announced that Dr. King's funeral would be televised the next day. So the dean of our cathedral and the leadership of the Metropolitan Interchurch Agency, which is a large group of Protestants and Catholics in Kansas City, organized a service at the cathedral uh, for Tuesday morning. Because of the tension uh, in the metropolitan area, the Kansas City, Kansas School District canceled classes for Tuesday so that students could stay home and watch the funeral. The situation in Kansas City, Missouri was very different. Dr. James Hazlitt, the superintendent of schools on the Missouri side, had conversations with his staff over the weekend, decided he would not cancel school under any circumstances and left town on a business trip on Sunday afternoon. Thus, classes in Missouri were kept open and students were expected to be in school. Tuesday morning, the dean and I were busily organizing the service as it promised to be a major event attended by most of the clergy in the community, and you can imagine a 26-year-old clergyman uh, being in charge of something that massive. What we didn't know at the time was that while we were putting the last-minute touches on the service, large numbers of black students were leaving classes at Lincoln, Manuel, and Central High Schools <coughs> and demanding that they be allowed to go home and watch Dr. King's funeral on television. 
When school authorities rejected their request, the young people began to demand that they be permitted to march to City Hall to protest. Not one single soul was present in the city with the authority to cancel school. Dr. Haslett was out of touch. The students' anger and frustration built. Some ran through the hallways and the schools kicking over trash cans. The school authorities, in some cases, called the police and they responded and in a couple of situations sprayed mace on the students. The news that classes weren't going to be canceled spread like wildfire as more and more kids left school and ran through the hallways of other schools encouraging students to join them. The kids poured out of the schools and into the streets. By now, we had a memorial service going at the cathedral and at one point, I looked up to see a member of the altar guild frantically waving her hands at me and mouthing the words, emergency, emergency. Well, I moved to her rather quickly, and when I entered the sacristy, I was giving a message for our assistant bishop, Robert Spears. Uh, I got Bishop Spears, who, was on the, who got on the phone and was told that that unruly crowds of kids were leaving school and beginning to march towards downtown. The NAACP representative asked that the clergy gathered for the service go immediately to the scene to try to organize the march and to attempt to keep things cool. He told the bishop that there had already been some violence and that he was worried that somebody was going to get hurt. <clears throat> So we quickly brought the service to an end, and the clergy gathered to discuss what to do. There was worry and fear as we talked about our concerns. A group of clergy, including our bishops, left for City Hall, which was to be the destination of the march, and many of the rest of us headed for the place where the marchers were. Father Ed Warner, a black priest who was the rector of St. Augustine's Episcopal Church uh, in Kansas City, and I, joined a crowd of students at 19th Street and Prospect Avenue, uh, if you know Kansas City. Several clergy who were with us had a good deal of experience organizing marches, so they quickly did an amazing job of pulling the group together. The clergy, many of us dressed in clerical collars, locked arms, and led as the march proceeded. But the feeling was very different than it had been on Palm Sunday. Then we had been so proud of our city and the nonviolent way those in the march responded. Today, however, I felt fear and, and apprehension uh, and saw it in the eyes of the clergy who were much more experienced with this stuff than I was. Um, at each cross street, police cars were in position to block the crowd from staying its course. The police stood silently watching many of them already wearing gas masks. Although isolated incidents of violence occurred on the part of students, stone throwing and police, use of mace on groups of students, um, the march was relatively peaceful until it reached Truman Road and Paseo, just a couple of miles from City Hall. The students intended to continue downtown but were stopped by lines of police. What we didn't know at the time is that Clarence Kelly, the chief of police, had told his officers that the students would not be allowed to go any farther than Truman Road and Paseo. Therefore, the tension on the part of the police, as well as on the part of the crowd, was intense. And the crowds pushed towards the line of police, with many of the students shouting angrily. The police were obviously anticipating trouble because they were fully dressed in riot gear. Many were holding rifles or cans of mace and the police dogs were straining at their leashes and growling fiercely. The confrontation at the Paseo confused and frightened us because it revealed the inadequacy of the city government's ability to respond to a crisis. The school board was a separate agency. The police department was governed by a state-appointed police commission, 
and was therefore not answerable to the mayor. Thus, the critical agencies involved on that day had no coordination. Here's an example of what I mean. Mayor Eilis Davis arrived in a police car, <clears throat> and from the moment he stepped out of the car, he was barraged with angry words. But if he was afraid, he didn't show it. He spoke with the students who demanded that they have permission to march downtown. One of the young people asked why the students were being stopped. Is it because, Mr. Mayor, you want to keep the black problem in the black part of town? Are you ashamed of us, Mr. Mayor? Is that why you keep us out here with your policemen and the clubs and the gas? We want to find out. We want to go downtown. A number of students and even some of the clergy spoke to the mayor and to the crowds. A disc jockey from a local radio station said to the mayor, let them go downtown, Mr. Mayor. They'll listen to you. And Mayor Davis, bravely, I thought, raised his hands over his head and said, I'll march with you. And he began to say, up Paseo, up Paseo. At that moment, two policemen grabbed the mayor by the elbows, led him back to the police car and said, Mayor, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> At that point, all hell broke loose. Students jammed their way through police lines and ran down I-70 towards downtown. This was a chaotic moment because the march had become a run. And I cannot tell you how frightening it was as students began to run up on I-70, running down the center stripe of that highway with traffic coming. Uh, I remember Bishop Spears and a number of us ran down the highway to try to wave down the traffic. Uh, we were so afraid that one of those oncoming cars would mow down a group of teenagers. When the main body of the group arrived at City Hall a little after noon, leaders organized a hasty demonstration on the steps. Somebody had come up with a bullhorn for the speakers. Uh, 400 to 500 students were jammed together on the plaza between City Hall and the county courthouse. Father Warner and I and some of the other clergy who had joined the march stood in the crowd. We were exhausted by our long walk downtown, exhausted by the fear we had felt uh, as we saw the confrontation on the Paseo, and exhausted by running up and down I-70 attempting to wave down traffic. We guessed that most in the crowd were tired as we were. Uh, as the speeches continued, a large number of police, sheriffs, deputies, and state patrol Many in full riot gear surround the crowd with increasing urgency. Father Warner and I began to worry that this escalated police presence would needlessly increase the tension. And we spoke to a couple of officers about removing the dogs and putting the guns out of sight. Things had begun to take on an air of a demonstration as speakers took the bullhorn. Some of the young people uh, recited a list of grievances from all that had happened earlier that morning. A young black woman in her 30s and with tears streaming down her face began to tell the students they would gain nothing by burning and looting as others were doing in cities across the United States. It began to look as though the speakers were establishing some sense of order, although the numbers of police, men and dogs continued to heighten the tension. When it seemed that most of the energy of the demonstration had drained out of the gathering, a local disc jockey announced that the students would be welcome to go to Holy Name Catholic Church for a dance. Now, that's really appealing to a bunch of young kids. It's time for a dance. And somebody had even arranged for buses to be provided that would bus the kids back to Holy Name Church. Um, so I was so relieved because they weren't walking and therefore I wouldn't have to walk with them. <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, Father Warner and I even joked 
about the fact that we certainly didn't have any intention of walking to the church for a dance uh, because Father Warner said, I just bought this brand new pair of shoes and that was before I knew I was going to make a march downtown and they're not meant for marching. My feet are killing me. Um, we laugh, but our smiles didn't last very long because at that precise moment, a riot began. Maybe a student threw an empty bottle at a police line. Maybe it broke. Maybe an officer launched a tear gas canister. It may have been that an officer simply panicked and threw a canister into the crowd. Nobody ever knew. Regardless of how the riot began, the police responded by throwing canister after canister of gas into the now frantic crowd. When I heard those canisters pop, I thought, my God, someone's shooting. They're shooting these kids. Students began running as the police in riot helmets and plastic masks charged into the crowd with tear gas, mace, dogs, and clubs. Ed Warner and I turned to run. We'd been standing in front of a group of police officers. They saw us. They knew we were clergy. We had spoken to some of them. But as they began moving towards us, we didn't stay around. As I started running across the lawn in front of the courthouse, I realized that Ed wasn't with me. I turned back to see him being held by a police officer in a gas mask who seemed to be searching him. I heard Father Warner say, wait a minute, I'm a priest of the church. I'm on your side. I ran over to Ed as he tried to talk to the officer, but the police knocked him to the pavement with a club. Tear gas was beginning to billow around us. Two other officers grabbed me and I was struck twice in the chest with a club. I went down like a rock. I tried to crawl away, but was overcome by the tear gas. Nothing like having the breath knocked out of you and trying to breathe and getting nothing but tear gas. The next thing I heard was the voice of a young black man who screamed, hey, a brother is down. The nicest words I had ever heard in my life. About five young black men helped carry me to a parked car belonging to WDAF news station. And the cameraman helped me uh, in, into the car and lay me in the back seat. As we sped off, he called back to me, I'll take you to St. Luke's Hospital if you want, if you can, if you, but if you can make it, he said, let's drive by Holy Name. Well, I said yes, even though I could hardly breathe. And when we got to Holy Name Church, from that back seat, I witnessed something I'll never forget. As many as 400 kids had made it back to the church where a dance was being held in the basement. As we watched, police units surrounded the church. I watched as they blocked the wooden basement doorway so that no one could get out of the building and then began to throw tear gas through the squat little basement windows. I can still hear the screams of the kids as they were trapped inside the church. It was a horrible scene. At St. Luke's Hospital, I was treated for cracked ribs and taped up. I didn't get back to the cathedral till the afternoon. But then it had become a command center of sorts to keep track of developments in the city. The dean called me into a meeting. By this time, news reports on the day's events uh, included stories of the two clergymen who had been beaten by the police. The dean said, I don't want to frighten you, but we've received threatening calls to the cathedral since the reports came out. Um, my wife and the lives of my, my life, my, my life and the lives of my family had been threatened. Uh, nothing like this, of course, had ever happened to me. And I was filled with fear for my wife and my three young daughters. The dean assured me that they were fine and that a couple in the congregation we're providing a place for them to sleep that evening. I call my parents in Monette, Missouri to arrange for my family to spend the rest of the week there, which they did. They left the next day. The dean had already arranged a room for me at the hotel across the street from the cathedral. 
Later in the day, I, along with many of the clergy and others who had witnessed the scene that morning, appeared on a live television show which was aired by all the stations in town. I don't know that it's ever been done before. All the stations picked up the same feed. We simply told our stories. They were pretty raw and fresh. We told what we'd seen and experienced that morning. Grace and Holy Trinity was a busy place that day and for the next four days. The violence in the city increased as students returned home to their neighborhoods and told others of what had happened. Uh, at, by Tuesday night, burning and looting had occurred in some parts of town. A seven o'clock curfew was established and police arrested many blacks who violated it. The jails were filled to overflowing uh, and the Metropolitan Interchurch Agency arranged for some churches to handle the overflow. And Grace and Holy Trinity opened its doors and we housed many young people there. Uh, and it basically was a, a situation where uh, the police would bring them to the cathedral and we would say, look, we're not a jail. You can leave if you want. If you leave, you'll probably get arrested. So you can sleep the night here we have cots, we have bologna sandwiches from the Salvation Army. Uh, so take a rest and have a sandwich. So most of the kids did. Um, I've never eaten bologna again because of the memories associated with it. Uh, staff and volunteers uh, from the Metropolitan Church Agency arrived to take statements uh, from the young people about their treatment at the hands of the police. The agency provided uh, volunteer clergy to act as watchers in, at, at every police precinct to protect both those who were arrested, but, it, but to protect the police as well from charges of abuse. The cathedral remained open 24 hours a day for the next four days uh, as violence in the street intensified and before it finally settled. In those four days, six blacks died at the hands of, of police and many more were injured. During Holy Week of 1968, uh, I, I have to tell you, I saw the church at its best, and I saw it at its worst. I saw the community at its best and at its worst. At times, I was reminded of the days in Monette, Missouri, back in the mid-50s, when all those events of Little Rock shocked us so much. And now I saw members of the cathedral congregation that I served uh, confronting the issues of racism in a way that they had never done before. We couldn't avoid those issues any longer. I think I want to stop there uh, and simply ask you uh, for questions or comments. Uh, I'd be glad to respond to those. Yes, sir. Okay, my name is John McKay. I'm supported to the Davidson University Department January 1, 1961, and retired in August of 92. I spent every minute of that riot at the riot. I disagree with some of what you said, but I've asked you, I asked you two questions. One is, have you ever heard of Solomonsky? I, I have. have. And do you give him any credit for the riot? Uh, no, I don't. And why is that? Um, because he had people in Kansas City, and I know that. Yes, yeah, Solomonsky was a community organizer and from what? Chicago. From where? From Chicago. But what was his what was his politics? He was an out and out communist. Well, he, he, he was an organizer of at every place he went had a riot. He organized a group in Kansas City known as Project Equality. Yes, he did. Uh, and uh, many of the churches were involved in that. I, I give him an awful lot of credit for that riot. You're in, you're you're entitled to that. Opinion. I, I just don't have it. You had another question. The other question was, I, I read your article last January in the Historical Review, 
Did you interview anybody else than Al Brooks? Oh, I, this is, yeah, I, had, I did no interviews with Alvin Brooks. I, I ran into Alvin Brooks, as a matter of fact, last, um, a year ago, um, when I was doing a presentation on this very thing in Kansas City. But no, I didn't interview Alvin Brooks for this. Uh, what happened to the guy that was with you? When you said that you got hit to the ground, but you never told us what happened to him in the... In the Oh, he came out of it in pretty good shape. He, uh, he was able to crawl away and, uh, and, and, and came out of it fine. We often refer to that as our baptism together. Uh, <laughs> yes? I wonder what could have or should have been done. Should the police have been, were they surprised by this and really didn't know what to do? Uh, should there be some kind of a training? I mean, it was too late now, but... Uh, it seemed like it really got chaotic without anybody uh, knowing what to do that was right. They were just trying to do something. But... Well, these, uh, these are pretty chaotic times. And John, I'm sure you understand that. Well, if, if, if part of this lady's question, and I, haven't, I didn't think I heard it at all. To begin with, <coughs> I was always real proud of Kansas City because there was no picture came out of Kansas City of looting, which you saw in all of the cities where the policemen sat there and didn't do anything. Chicago was a prime example, where you didn't, you didn't have that in Kansas City. The riot was broke the first night. It was very, very much contained within a very small area. Right, at, at a very short time. The six were killed, I don't know how many, I've forgotten, were at the Bryant Hotel. I think two at the hotel, yeah. I have pretty much to say, if I may. Please do. Um, not to take away, I'm Pat Baylor, and uh, I was in Kansas City at the same time. So I really appreciate knowing some things that happened that I had no idea were happening. I was working as a children's librarian on the east side of town, at Southeast High School. Um, Southeast, or the, high, the library was in the high school building. And the high, that high school had been becoming uh, a predominantly black attended school, high school. So by the time I was working in the library in 68, most of the young people that came to the children's section were black children. People had moved uh, south on the east side of town. Uh, as my relationship and our my other workers were in the library we had very friendly relationships and feelings with the kids things were just a nice good children's library that afternoon when we heard about it we were all of us of course everybody but we were just shocked and the library was immediately closed as were many things we heard for instance well we heard things and, and these don't relate to the riot per se but this is how it can happen um, we heard that Westport High School, which was farther north, but on that side of town, which probably had a black and white makeup of students, was having riots right then. I don't know. You know, this was something we heard. We also heard that the Country Club Plaza, which as some of you may know, which is an upscale shopping area, was being looted and, and rioting was going on, and we must go home immediately. So I'm just trying to kind of say, right. these are some things that were happening too. I really don't remember other than knowing that, that the library wasn't open for a period of time. So all of this was going on then, of course, while the library in the school system, the library uh, was connected, not directly with the school system, but in the same building, the headquarters downtown at that time. Um, the positive thing that happened, in my opinion, in Kansas City, and this is skipping ahead, past the riots, you may know of it, I think it was probably connected with Project Equality. We were offered in Kansas City then, um, perhaps a month, two months later, the opportunity to meet white people with black people. And it was basically set up that way. And we met on the east side because most of the black people in Kansas City at that time lived on the east side. Uh, we had a continuing series, of course, to try to establish some mutual understanding of uh, bettering race relations. I think it helped. 
Um, I'll go ahead and jump to Jeff City in a minute because of something that happened, but I just point out that we really have frank conversations. Um, may may I say, rights. excuse me, may yeah. I say about that program? Yes. Um, that was not involved at all with Project Equality. Okay. That was a program called Kansas City Crisis. Thank you. And okay. I was involved in the creation of that program, as a matter of fact. And um, it began in meetings at the cathedral uh, right after this. And, and, and it came out of a plea by the, the Episcopal Bishop of, of um, West Missouri who said, we need to come together and talk with one another. We're not, we, there is a great gulf fixed. Uh, and so that whole program was set up to, uh, to have blacks and whites sit together in the same room uh, and talk to one another about the issues as they saw them. And it was a powerful program. Congratulations. Well, that was... stayed with me forever. Um, several things, for instance, that happened, I'm just using these as examples, was that a young black woman said to me, I am really tired of seeing white Santa Clauses all the time. So that was, you know, a comment. She also said, I'm I don't know whether I feel like sitting with you white honkies tonight. That's the first time I'd ever heard that word. <laughs> and so, obviously, we began a dialogue. Well, I won't go into detail, but I'm happy to know, I'm proud to know that you were uh, connected with that program. I'm um, glad to know you remember it. Well, thank you. <laughs> and because of it, some of you may know of the existing group, uh, put a plug in now if I may, for the group that exists in, Kent, in Jefferson City called Congregations uh, United for Racial Equity. Uh, and uh, I have been a member of that, and uh, those of us who are in the group, I think many of us are a result of things that happened. I certainly was in that group because of the fact that I was in crisis in that group in Kansas City. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, my, my question isn't really a historical question, but more of a question of your perception of racism today. And in the 38 years since 1968, What's happened with racism in your, from your perspective? Somebody who's very involved in the civil rights movement, um, and, and how it's, and what it's involved in today. That's a tough question. Um, because in, in lots of ways it's disappeared. Um, it, 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 we've buried it. Um, in those days it was very out there. I mean, it, it was, it was something that we were dealing with in some, in some terribly dramatic ways. Um, but it seems, it, let me, I, I can only speak from my own experience, is that in, in some ways uh, this country has made great advances in relationships between blacks and whites. Um, but there is so much further to go, so much further to go. And, and I just don't see us addressing those questions. Uh, I, I just feel, as I look out on the society as a whole, that that, that gulf is still there. And it's a, it's a gulf that is more uh, a gulf of class, you know? And it just so happens that black folks fall into that class, um, that underclass, uh, so much more. Uh, but I, I think there, I think there's a great divide, and, and I just don't see us reaching across that divide. I'd like to make a comment regarding that. Uh, one of the things I noticed in this past uh, election and in, in a couple of years ago is the fact that politicians seem to use race baiting so much of the time, and it comes a lot of times from the black side, mm -hmm. and they don't seem to let their people forget, you know, those people forget that you know, we are supposed to be equal and have equal opportunities with it. When it comes to politics, it seems like they get in the same thing. So we have our own leaders that are actually using those things to try to get votes for this or that. And uh, I, I tell some of these people, stop, I don't, I don't know. Well, part of, it, what, you know, part of what you're doing with your dialogue group, I think, is, is I, I'd love to hear a dialogue for change instead of people yelling at one. relationships among clergy from different denominations after the riot took place? Did, that, did you see changes occur as a result of that? Well, it was a very powerful experience for the clergy uh, in terms of the kind of, um, 
the kind of togetherness that it created. You know, the, the, the clergy who were a part of the Metropolitan Church Agency, which were, was straight across the board, Roman Catholic, Protestant clergy, all of us were involved and were called out to be a part. And many, many, many clergy have volunteered to be a part. Also, uh, uh, people from the seminaries showed up in these various centers um, to deal with kids who had been arrested and put in overnight and so forth. It was, um, I thought it was a, an incredibly unifying experience for all of us. And did that, did that continue on afterwards? It, it, I left in 69, so I can't say, I, I don't know what the, the church in Kansas City has been like over those years. Um, but I do know that, that uh, I was just back at Grace and Holy Trinity Cathedral last weekend, uh, I stopped by. Uh, from we were driving back from western Kansas and it was it was so delightful to be there and to see that cathedral now serve as a uh, as a center for homeless people and uh, and see that that cathedral now serves 500 meals a day um, to the homeless in Kansas City and it's sort of a realization of a dream that the dean of the cathedral had when I was there in back, back in 1966, um, and it was it was a really marvelous thing to see. Yes. I just wonder uh, what could have been done to make it not so bad. Should, should the police just have backed off a while, let them go to the plaza? Just finally, that's a pretty far distance from there to the plaza. They might have been so tired that it would have dwindled out. Well, you know, I I think that there was a. There was a spirit of confrontation by the time people got down to um, um, Parade Park, wasn't it, John? Wasn't that where the confrontation really occurred? By the time it got to Parade Park, I think it was too late. It, it, was, it was out of control. And uh, I think that uh, I, I, I don't know what could have been done at that point. Uh, whether 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 Mayor Davis could have pulled that off, I don't know. If he had been able to lead a peaceful march downtown, uh, maybe it could have happened. But it, it was out of control at that point. What's the address of the Grace Cathedral? 13th and Broadway, right downtown. It's near the Roman Catholic Cathedral with the gold dome. We, we, that's how we always told people to get to it. Well, you go to the cathedral with a gold dome and we're next to it. <laughs> I, I would add this uh, to her, answer her question. You know, and I don't think you implied it even, but these were not a bunch of real goody-goody little school kids in this march. There were plenty of hell raisers in that march, too. They were looking for trouble. Yep. But there was ill feeling, I know, for instance, I worked in the library with children, but the uh, high school students were able to use the library, and there were uh, disgruntled young people for various reasons, legitimate or not, but there was ill feeling, I would say, among some of the black students in the high schools, especially on the east side of town before the unfortunate death of Martin Luther King Jr. You know, I, would, I, I think that what we saw in 1968 in Kansas City was a kind of inevitable result from a lot of years of, of, of both white and black experience that just came together and the, and the, the, the uh, assassination of Dr. King ignited that in a way that there was no going back. And it was painful. You mentioned right at the very beginning, this Dr. Hazlitt. What happened to him? Oh, um, you mean the uh, Dr. Hazlitt? Hazlitt, yes. Yeah, so. Oh, nothing happened to him. He just kept right on going. He kept on, he was. <laughs> you betcha. He remained the head of the yeah. school system. I think one of the things that I, I do find interesting, or did find interesting, about the, the makeup of, of the, 
the city uh, in terms of governmental structures is to have the police board, you know, Kansas City and, and St. Louis are the only two cities in the country, as far as I know, that have state-appointed police commissions um, that have no local kind of ownership. And it's just sort of an amazing uh, thing, but you saw the, the disconnect uh, there. The, the, uh, the school board, the city administration, every, it seemed like everybody was unrelated to everybody else. And so, so when it came time in a crisis for people to come together to make decisions, there was no coming together. People kept missing one another. Yes, ma'am. I just had a comment. I was teaching in Gary, Indiana. I graduated from Lincoln, as I tell the student, 100 years ago. And I was teaching in Gary, Indiana at that time. And I can remember Gary was, uh, well, is predominantly African American. And I remember just this sense of great loss. And I think that when you think, when you talk about the situation and write about it, I'm glad you have written about it because you're writing from your perspective. And that's a good thing because you do have to have a diversity of perspectives in order to understand something because it's almost like we're looking at it with different eyes. Each group, each person, and it's it's a combination of our experience that makes our eyes see it in a different way. And I can remember that it was such, to me, it was like I had lost a member of my family. When I heard it, it was like, oh God, not him. And then the thinking that, is he our, was he our last hope for equality in America <coughs> and this American dream? that we had, that African Americans were beginning to hear it voiced out loud and people were talking about it. So it was, it was like a death in the family and I think many young people view this as their last hope, last chance, you know. And so they reacted in ways that were very different than what we might think they should have acted and adults. But I do believe that the fact that the clergy was involved, not only in Kansas City, but in many other places, that it's an important thing, and to write about it, so that it's, it's safe for posterity, because many of our students today don't know. They don't understand where we came from and what it took to get us here, and they don't really appreciate the struggle, the, the loss, you know, the sense of, we're in this and is this our last hope with Martin Luther King? Today people applaud Martin Luther King. Some people hated him then and you didn't hear everybody talking about what a wonderful guy he was. They said he was a communist, you know. So I'm glad you're writing and I'm glad that we're talking about it and I do believe it makes our country a better country and that we are more in line with our constitution and what we say we are when we talk to each other and we exchange information. But I do believe we have to understand there are different eyes looking at a different situation, many times seeing different things. But together, we may get the true sense of what it is. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I, uh, I was thinking that John and I have, I'm sure, very different perspectives on how we saw all that stuff. I've got a dear friend down at the Lake of the Ozarks uh, I was sitting having a, a drink with one night, um, and uh, and we were talking about this, and Kansas City came up, and I began to tell this story, and he said, I was a member of the National Guard. I was called into Kansas City. And we sat there and talked about those times with one another, and talked about different perspectives, very different perspectives. He said, you know, it became real for me when they issued live ammunition. I knew this was serious, you know. So it, this was, it was an amazing kind of coming together of two people who saw things very differently and yet were able to share those views. And it sure helped me. Uh, a friend of mine, I mean, I'm reminded of, first of all, it could have been a lot worse, a lot worse. But a, a friend of mine re reminds me of uh, the chaos and the confusion that was there. All and, and he was a member of the Kansas National 
guard, he went out there and uh, <clears throat> he was talking about one evening when it was dark, uh, he and some friends were, some of his guard buddies were, uh, were standing at a, at a point and uh, they saw a number of people walking towards them. They, they couldn't make out who they were, what they, you know, they couldn't make out anything, but they were coming towards them. And they, I know the thought crossed uh, all of their minds is, do we open up on them? Do we shoot? And they came on up, they got up and walked under a street light, and it was law enforcement officers, highway patrol, police. I'm telling you, there was a, there was a point when they were going to shoot them. This, this, this was kind of the level of fear that folks were dealing with. I, I uh, remember I was in Kansas City, I guess, last spring doing a presentation at the uh, Plaza branch of the Kansas City L Library, uh, and it's a new facility, and as you stand there, you look out through these marvelous plate glass windows onto the rooftops of the plaza, and all I could think about as I was doing this presentation from 1968 was uh, the National Guard patrolling the rooftops uh, with rifles and not a soul moving, it being a ghost town. It was the most dramatic kind of scene. We had two officers that took care of all the police work in the entire city during the riots. Mm -hmm. That's how that's how naked the streets were. They were just bare. Yeah, yeah. They really were bare. People were afraid to go out. Yeah. <laughs> they were afraid to go out, and, and really, with the with the uh, curfews, they couldn't go out. They couldn't. Yes. Sir. I was wondering if based. Based on a you know 40 years later uh, reflection, what sort of comments you might have about the role of religion in American politics today? Well, let me um, share with you uh, when we were involved in setting up the Kansas City Crisis Program, which brought folks together. Um, there was a young black social worker, a guy named Bob Jones, who was working with us. And uh, he was instrumental in helping us set this up. And the, and the program would be done mostly in churches or, or in homes of church people with churchy folks. Yeah, that sort of <laughs> but Or non-churchy folks, whatever. Um, and Bob was, not a, Bob was not a member of a church. And I remember saying to him one time, Bob, you're not a churchman. I said, why are you putting all this energy into this program? And what he said to me was, David, I believe a time is coming in our country when people will no longer have a forum in which they can speak civilly to one another. The church may be the only place where that dialogue takes place. Now, I'm not so sure 40 years later that the church provides that forum uh, in which civil uh, discussion can take place. And one of the things that worries me is I don't see many places in our society for any kind of civil discussion. And uh, if I was urging anybody to do anything today, it would be to try to inject that, um, that kind of sense <laughs> in, into, into our society. Um, and, and I uh, have spent my life uh, working to do that kind of thing. I, um, I moved into a, a parish in, after serving many years in campus ministry after Kansas City. Um, 
I moved into a parish in Kansas City in the suburb, I mean, in St. Louis suburbs, Grace Church, Kirkwood, Missouri. Um, and I remember one time, soon after I got there, that we had a men's breakfast every Wednesday morning around a big square table. And I walked in one morning and Mr. Conservative was sitting on one side of the table. And Mr. Liberal was sitting on the other side of the table. You couldn't find two guys that were further apart on issues. And they started going at one another. Now, I was new. I, I wasn't sure that these guys weren't going to come to blows, you know? And I was sitting next to Mr. Conservative, and I thought, you know, I'm going to have to inject myself into this thing because this could get serious. You know, and finally, he turned to me and said, you know, he said, I couldn't say these things to him if I didn't love him. He said, you know, we've lived under this roof together for a long time. I thought, my God, that's the vision of the church, or that's the vision of a civil conversation that that guy was talking about to me back in 1968. Uh, and, and I was really pleased that I'd been there at that moment to see it and to hear it. I've been grateful to have the opportunity to write this paper. Uh, and very grateful to have it published uh, and have the opportunity to talk with folks about it uh, because as you say it every time I do this there's an opportunity to share different perspectives from different people who were there at the time who saw things happen uh, and who, who bring together that rich kind of picture uh, of what was taking place so again, thank you very much. I've enjoyed being with you. Thank you.